Glory. Amen. You grab your pen, your notebook, your Bible, and you can be seated with your sweet, smart self this morning. Hallelujah. Mm -mm -mm. All right. We're beginning a series this morning on being filled with the Spirit. Being filled with the Spirit. And I want to begin this morning by laying a foundation on how to get people filled with the Holy Ghost. How to get people filled with the Holy Ghost. The teaching of Scripture is the definition of doctrine. The teaching of scripture is the definition of doctrine. Doctrine is not what somebody thinks or what some church say you should do. Doctrine is practically, primarily, the teaching of scripture. When we say doctrine, we didn't say doctrines, we said doctrine. Doctrine. The Bible tells us that from a child you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. 2 Timothy 3, 15, verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. Doctrine. Not doctrines. Doctrine. Singular. Singular. We don't have doctrines. We have a doctrine. We have a singular teaching. We have a singular explanation of the scriptures. A singular revelation of the scriptures. The scripture is not books. It's a book with a message and a character. Is a book with a message and a character. One book, one message, one character. Pay attention to Second Peter chapter one, verse number nineteen. Brother Peter speaking in Second Peter chapter one, verse number nineteen. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. Did you see singular? The Bible is prophecy, not prophecies. The Bible is a prophecy. A singular revelation is a prophecy. We don't have doctrines. We have a doctrine. We have a prophecy. Put it back again. We have a more sure word of prophecy where unto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Look at the next verse. Next verse 20. Knowing this first, that no prophecy, prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. The whole scripture, the whole Bible is a prophecy. No prophecy of the scripture is of the, any private. It didn't say scriptures. It didn't say scriptures. No prophecy of the scripture is of any private origin interpretation. For, next verse, 21. Now observe carefully, 21. For the prophecy, for the prophecy, not the prophecies, the prophecy, the entire book is one prophecy. For the prophecy, a singular revelation of God. A singular consistent revelation of God. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. But holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So, the teaching of scripture is the definition of doctrine. The scripture refers to what is written. What is written. What is written. It is a fact that these are words. Words inscribed in the pages of the Bible, a book which explains itself. The Bible is self explanatory. That is why you do not import, you do not import your thoughts into the scriptures because the scriptures have their own meaning. The scripture is self explanatory, it has its own meaning. Don't try to think for the scriptures. The scripture has its own thought. The scripture has its own message. Don't try to impose and import a message in the scripture or make the scripture say what the scripture is not saying. Why? Because the teaching of scripture is the definition of doctrine. That is what defines doctrine. It is not what our church has been doing forever. No, the definition of, of doctrine is the teaching of scripture. Somebody said, but I don't like doctrine. Well, if you don't like doctrine, then you don't like scripture. Because the entire scripture is the doctrine. The doctrine of Christ. Look at 2 John chapter 1 verse number 8. 2 John chapter 1 verse number 8. Look to yourselves that we do not lose those things which we have wrought but that we receive a full reward. Next verse. <clears throat> Whosoever transgressed and abided not in the doctrine of Christ, the doctrine, singular, the doctrine of Christ, the message, 
the revelation of Christ. Whosoever does not abide. To abide means to take up residence. It means a permanent place of abode. A permanent place of your stay. You need to abide. That is supposed to be the mainstay of the church. The doctrine, the teaching, the explanation of Christ. And he says anybody that does not abide in that hath not God. He doesn't have God. He that abideth in the doctrine, doctrine, singular revelation, singular explanation, singular teaching of Christ. He hath both the father and the son. So if you say you don't want doctrine, you're not a believer. You're not even a Christian because it is doctrine that defines your union with God. Are we in the building here? He said that man hath not God. So scripture therefore should be read and understood should be read and understood why because it is self-explanatory look at ephesians chapter 3 verse 3 see what brother paul says to the church at ephesus ephesians chapter 3 verse number 3 how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery as i wrote afore in few words whereby next verse when you read verse 4 whereby when you read the scriptures are self-explanatory whereby when you read you may understand so you read to understand my knowledge where in the mystery of christ what is the mystery of christ again the doctrine of christ which is the proof that a man has both the father and the son or does not even have god the doctrine the teaching of scripture the singular revelation of the scripture. So, the scriptures therefore are written to be read. They are written to be read. Look at Jesus harping on this fact in Matthew chapter 19 verse 4. Matthew chapter 19 verse number 4. And he answered and said unto them, Have you not read? Because the scriptures are supposed to be read. Many people ask questions because they are not reading the scriptures. Because if you read the scripture, it is self-explanatory. It is self-explanatory. Especially after we teach you. Because first of all, you can't study the Bible for yourself. Because you don't even know where to, what to study. So when we teach you, you now take the instructions and go and search for yourself. And get the, the teachings, you know, enshrined into your understanding. Have you not read Anaginosko? Have you not read because Jesus expected them to read? Are we still in the building here? He said this severally. The term to read means to view. Have you not viewed? To mentally capture and appraise words. To read means to mentally capture and appraise words that are written. To mentally capture and appraise words that are written. This implies that the teacher of the word must read and have his audience read too. It's critical. I read, you too will have to read. So, the essence of teaching is to get you to read and read with a view to mentally capture and appraise the message of the scriptures. With a view, you must read with a view to understand. Don't just read. You read with an intent to understand what you're reading. That's why the Philip, Philip asked the eunuch, you are reading, but do you understand? Because the intent for reading is understanding. Whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Are we still in the building? First Timothy 4.13. See what brother Paul said to Timothy. First Timothy chapter 4 verse number 13. Till I come, give attendance to reading. To reading. Give attendance to reading. To exhortation and to doctrine. To explanation. To doctrine. Give attendance like a student will attend lectures consistently, continually, without stopping. You also till i come that means the church is one school you only matriculate and never graduate till i come so from the day you come into a teaching church like this you registered as a lifetime student 
till I come, give attendance to reading and to doctrine, till I come. So, true Bible teaching is study. True Bible teaching is study. <clears throat> true Bible teaching is study. Hallelujah. So, this morning, we're examining how to get people filled with the Holy Ghost. Uh, and, of course, by implication, how to also get you that is not filled with the Holy Ghost. Because there are people that are in church that are not filled with the Holy Ghost. Please watch what I say. That are not filled with the Holy Ghost. I didn't say they are not born of the Spirit. They are not filled. And in the course of teaching, those words will come handy. First Corinthians 12, 1 Corinthians 12.1. First Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 1. Now, concerning spiritual gifts, actually, the, the original has it not. Now, concerning spirituals, and of course, whenever you see now, it means therefore. Therefore, concerning spirituals, brethren, I will not have you ignorant. I will not have you ignorant. The word ignorant there is the word agneo. Agneo. A-G-N-O-E-O. -E agneo in the Greek. A-G-N-O-E-O. O E O for those making notes. Somebody said I should slow down when I'm reading Greek words. A G N U O E O Agneo. Many times it is used for willful ignorance, intentional ignorance, deliberate ignorance. Agneo. Willful ignorance. You just don't want to know about it. You just don't want to know. For instance, if you have never bothered checking the book stand out there to get the books I have written for you, to get the messages I have been teaching for years, a plethora of messages, you are in willful ignorance. You are in willful ignorance. That is to say, nobody is responsible for your ignorance and the repercussions that comes with it. It is your deliberate choice and deliberate acquisition willful ignorance nobody can help you including god when you subscribe to willful ignorance nobody can help you even god takes his hands off at that point because the way of escape that god makes for you is the teaching materials that's the way of escape and if you ignore god's way of escape then god can even god becomes handicapped where you are concerned because you are in deliberate and intentional ignorance it's not that it's not available teachings are available materials are available but you have decided to subscribe to the school of illiteracy it's willful ignorance you have never taken one of the books that takes me years and hours painstakingly that sucks out my blood sucks out my energy to put together you've never read one and you're in this church and you're asking too many questions you are in willful ignorance you've deliberately decided that you and satan will stay in darkness because ignorance is darkness and satan is the prince of the darkness of this world so don't complain that the devil is after you you gave him fertilizer to go after you you created an enabling environment for satanic pursuit when you admitted intentional ignorance teaching good this morning yeah it's not anybody's fault okay means you have chosen his choice to be ignorant nobody made you ignorant notice what paul says about this church first corinthians 1 7 pay attention first corinthians chapter 1 verse number 7 so that you come behind in no gift Waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is, you, you, you are not left behind in the gifts of the spirit. You operate spiritual gifts. Yet he said to that church that is full of gifts, I will not have you ignorant. That means that you are gifted doesn't mean you have knowledge. So, beyond gifts, you must go for knowledge. You come behind in no gift in chapter, chapter 1. In chapter 12, he says, I wouldn't have you ignorant concerning spirituals. The word gift, there is the word charisma in the Greek. Charisma. Charisma. C-H-A-R-I-S-M-A. 
M-A, charisma. Despite the fact that they are behind in no gift, so it's not like they are ignorant of gifts. What Paul was talking to them about, if you notice very well, is the house, the house to operate the gifts. You can have gifts, but you lack the house of operating them. You can have gifts, and the way you operate them can make the gifts questionable. So, brother Paul was talking about the house when he was talking to that church. Agnew. Agnew also is failing to recognize. Failing to recognize. Many times in this epistle, brother Paul talked to that church in Corinth about knowledge. Knowledge. If you notice, the problem he had with them is, he said they were babes. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as unto spiritual, but as unto babes. As unto babes. They were babes. He, he, you know, and because he, they, they, they were babes, they, there was much Paul, Paul couldn't teach them. And he didn't call them babes because he just got born again yesterday. He didn't call them babes because they are new in church. Somebody can be new in church and more mature than somebody that was there when the foundation was laid. So it's not the longevity of being in church that determines spiritual maturity. It's the longevity of understanding Christ. He called them babes, not because they just got born again. No, but because they were not paying attention to the teaching and the knowledge that was required by the word of God. Are you still in the building? He called them babes because they were not walking in the world. They were not walking in the light that was available to them. So he couldn't feed them with meat. He couldn't feed them with meat. He could only feed them with milk. Milk. All right, and he called them babes. The word nepios in the Greek, nepios, where you have, you know, you know, you know, napkin, you know, nepios, napkin, you know, napkin is used for babies. Okay, nepios, nepios. All right, he called them nepios in the Greek, and many times there was no other church. He called their knowledge to question. That was the only church that Brother Paul emphatically called their knowledge. You know, he called their knowledge to question all through the book of Corinthians. In fact, look at 1 Corinthians 3.16. Let's do a little bit of study. 1 Corinthians 3.16. Know ye not, see the word knowledge, know ye not that you are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwelleth in you. Know ye not, 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 2. Do you not know... That the saints shall judge the world. Do you not know? Know ye not? Do you not know? First Corinthians chapter 6 verse 3. Chapter 6 verse 3. Chapter 6 verse 3. Know ye not that we shall judge angels? Know ye not? The same church. Alright. First, first Corinthians chapter 6 verse 9. First Corinthians chapter 6 verse 9. Know ye not that the right unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Know ye not. Know ye not. Know ye not. First Corinthians 6 15. First Corinthians 6 15. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Know ye not. The same church. Know ye not, look at verse 19 of 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? Look at chapter 6, verse 16. Chapter 6, verse 16. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? Know ye not, so that church, brother Paul called their knowledge to question. Know ye not, one church, know ye not, one church, know ye not, know ye not, know ye not. I wouldn't have you ignorant. I wouldn't have you He kept talking about knowledge with the church at Corinth. So when it comes to spiritual babes, don't be particular about their conduct. Like you are particular about what they know. When it comes to spiritual babes, don't be particular about their conduct like you're particular about what they know because it is what they know that informs their conduct. It is what they know that informs their conduct. Amen? <clears throat> I said amen. Yeah. You know, when Jesus got to his hometown and they didn't receive his ministry, he didn't outrightly condemn them. No. He went ahead to teach them the word of God exhaustively in the book of mark chapter 6 
Look at it. Mark chapter 6 verse 1. <clears throat> I'm going to read six verses. And he went on from, out from thence and came into his own country. And his disciples followed him. Verse 2. And when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue. He began to teach. If you observe that everywhere Jesus was found in the synagogues, he was teaching. He didn't preach in the synagogues. He was always teaching. Because teaching is the only way to build. Precept upon precept. Teaching is not haphazard. Teaching is organized. Teaching is systematic. And teaching is gradual. Teaching is painstaking. You know. Preaching is anyhow. Just proclaim and declare. But teaching. Teaching is organized. So Jesus was always teaching in the synagogues. Put it up for me. He began to teach, verse 2, in the synagogue. And many hearing him were astonished, saying, From whence are this man these things? And what wisdom is this which is given unto him, that even such mighty works are wrought by his hand? Next verse. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph, and of Judah and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country. And among his own kin and in his own house next verse and he could dare he could dare do no mighty works he couldn't even if he wanted to he couldn't they put breaks they put restraint they restricted him it's not that he didn't want to he just couldn't they restricted him dishonor restricts the ministry of a man of god in your direction Dishonor can make you a member of this church and not a partaker of the grace of this ministry. So you're physically in this church, but the impact and the influence of God's word, the grace that is available, that makes things happen beyond explanation, can be seen in your life. So you're in a church where there's a lot of grace, things are happening easily for your ministry, but you yourself, you're under heavy yoke. You're carrying irons on your head. That makes it difficult for you to move. You're under a graceful ministry. But you, you are graceless. Because of dishonor. Familiarity. I know. I know. I know. The moment Papa comes is John 5, 39. Luke 24, 25 to 27. As if we are stupid people. He doesn't know we have understood it. I know. So today I won't go with pen and paper. If he's talking, I'll just be like, I know what he's going to say. I know. Dishonor. Dishonor is very costly. Honor costs you nothing, but dishonor costs you everything. Honor will cost you nothing. Honor will cost you nothing, but dishonor will cost you everything. Jesus could dare do no mighty miracles. Put it up for me. He could dare do no mighty works. Save that he laid his hands upon a few sick folk and healed them. Look at the next verse. And he marveled because of their unbelief. He called dishonor unbelief. That is dishonor is faithlessness. A man in dishonor has no faith. And it takes faith to receive from God. That means a man in dishonor cannot receive from God. See that? Because a man in dishonor is double minded. The reason why you're in dishonor is because you believe but you don't believe. You're double-minded. You believe but you don't believe. You trust but you don't trust. So, you're listening suspiciously because you don't believe. You don't trust. You cannot relax to just be blessed by the ministry. No, you are suspicious. And because you're suspicious, even you yourself don't trust yourself. So, you can't receive. A man in that atmosphere cannot receive. That's why some people can't receive any spiritual impartation. Brother Paul said, I long to see you. That I may impart. And impartation is done. Anyway, we're going to get into it. You know, either in this or second service. Impartation is done on a people that believe. A people that are receptive. A people that are in honor. A people that are respectful. If you're, not, if you're, if you're full of disrespect. And disrespect doesn't mean that you're outrightly rude to somebody. You can be very disrespectful in your heart. You're doing everything that makes you look like you're respectful, but in your heart, you're in, you disdain. You disdain. And spirituals are heart to heart. Deep color to deep. I can't impart on you by even touching you, but I can impact 
on you by speaking words. And you open up to those words in honor and those words will go and do wonders in your heart. That's why Jesus will say, ah, I've never seen this kind of faith before. Because the guy said, you don't have to come to my house. That is honor. Don't come to my house, sir. Don't stress yourself. Don't travel down just to come to my house. Your words carry power. You don't need to physically be in my house. Just speak the word. And your word will do the job. Jesus said, what? I've, I've never seen this kind of faith. He called that honor faith. He, Jesus called honor faith. This honor will deprive you, deny you, rob you, and cost you so much. This honor can make you go around one circle for the rest of your life. This honor can keep you in a place where grace is available to push you, but because of this honor, the grace can't access you. And that is why <laughs> you can't afford to play with ministry that God has directed in your direction. Are you in the building? I like explaining and explaining scriptures. I like it. I enjoy it. You know, you, you have to be blind not to, even if you're blind, you will know that I like explaining scriptures. I, it gives me the utmost, you know, delight. So Jesus, Jesus, now when he saw that dishonor, what did he do to that place? Bible says he began to teach. He began to teach because the cure for dishonor is teaching. The cure for dishonor is teaching. You keep teaching, you keep teaching, you keep teaching until the people come to a place of placing value on what they are receiving. But you know, it's unfortunate. Some people never come there. Ever learning is unfortunate. Some people never ever arrive at a place of honor. So they never arrive at a place of receiving from God. They take things for granted and remain, you know, in the familiar zone. When they stay with that familiarity and they stay in the you know, in that realm. And yet you see somebody that is not even a part of the ministry just passing by. He's just passing by. The grace of the ministry just descends on him and the guy is already enjoying it. And somebody has been there for long. You know, the only proof that he's been there for long is the sand that has rubbed off on him in the course of the journey. You know, when you travel for a long time on a sandy road, the dust will come on you. That's the proof that he's been around. He can tell the stories of what happened 2014. 2003 we were here 2005 2010 you know you don't know anything you are just new say you are new you are new I just new. somebody was sharing with us in the uh, this, uh, house center pastors meeting and he said there's an old member of this church who is living by his house and never attends house fellowship and every and he is new he's been in this church just a few months and he's a house fellowship leader and he's busy telling that brother join the fellowship the brother said you are new. You are new. Where were you? Do you know how long we've, I've been in the church? I've been in the church before you. Long. You just came yesterday now. We have already done our own. It's time for you to do your own. That's dishonor. That's total dishonor. Dishonor to Christ. Dishonor to this ministry. Dishonor to that house center and the brethren in that house center. Dishonor to everything that Christ represents. Total disdain. Because you are a bad example, you are a discouragement, you are not an inspiration, and there is no proof that you have ever understood John 3.16. There's no proof. You don't know nothing. You are far from the truth. You are far because when you understand scripture, you edify. Knowledge edify. To edify means you build. But scripture that you understand that will not build anybody, you didn't understand it. You are far from the truth. Am I talking to somebody here? You are far from the truth. And if you are new in church and any brother tells you he's been here since Jesus Christ was born and he's not showing an example, ignore him. Don't take him serious at all. He doesn't know anything. Don't take him serious. Don't let anybody block you. Jesus says only Pharisees that stand at the gate. They refuse to enter and they stop others from. It's only a Pharisee and a Pharisee cannot access the things of God. I'll still say more. Don't worry. I'm just warming up. Just warming up. I'm just warming up. The Bible says, when the time for you to be teachers, when so there's a time you are in church where you should be a teacher. There's a time you can't be in church all your life as a floor member. God forbid. There's a time within a few months of intensive teaching, it should be itching you to teach. 
Brother Paul said, when, I mean the writer of Hebrews, when the time for you to be teachers, you still are in need of the elementary things of Christianity. You are a waster of grace. You are a waster of grace. We have not received the grace of God in vain. The reason for receiving grace is so that we can give grace to others. We minister grace to hear us. Are you Am I communicating at all? How do you receive grace? Grace and peace be multiplied through knowledge. So as I'm teaching, now what are you receiving? Grace. You're receiving grace. And when the time now comes, after a while of receiving, when you should now dispense grace to others, you are still in need of elementary teaching. You are a waster of grace. Total waste. Colossal waste of grace. There's a time you yourself should be an institution that when people encounter you, they know that you have been a custodian of the mystery of Christ. A steward of the mysteries of Christ. Am I teaching this morning? So brother Paul took time to deal with this church. No, you not. No, you not. No, you not. All over the place. Because uh, with all that I'm doing, you are still babes. Canality is still showing. There is still division among you. Is this same church, brother Paul? Say, how be it? There is not in every man this knowledge. Is this same church? In chapter 8 of 1 Corinthians. How be it? There is not in every... So, Brother Paul's emphasis for the church at Corinth was knowledge. Knowledge. Is that same church he said, they are, you know, some of them, they are knowledge perfect. He told them some of them, you have acquired a lot of knowledge from my teaching and you have become pompous. So the knowledge that shall have made you humble has made you proud. That means you're not getting the right kind of knowledge. Because if you're understanding well, you're, it should affect your attitude. You see? You see, knowledge is supposed to edify, not to puff. So now because you have knowledge, you don't greet anybody in church. You expect everybody to greet you. You say, you know, the, 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 the transliteration of that word, that word, in the Greek, when you look at the Septuagint Greek, with all the grammar, you don't even know anything. You don't even know anything. You think it's grammar. This is beyond grammar. They say spirituality. Because life is spiritual. Life is not English language. There are people that can speak English more than the queen and life has tortured them. So it's not, it's not, it doesn't end in English. English is starting point. English is, is where we begin. But it doesn't end there. There's more to life than that. Am I communicating at all? It's like now I say I, I, I have some level of understanding then I respect nobody. What kind of foolishness? What kind of a fool will I be? What kind of a fool will I be? How much do I know? Do I even know anything? Do I even know anything? I'm just starting. I'm just starting. God is my witness. I'm just starting. We are still at introductory level. After 30 years of intensive revelation knowledge, Brother Paul said that I may know him. 30 years of intensive revelation knowledge, Paul was still praying that I may know him. It's after 30 years. So some of us that are just warming up, what do you know? Some of you, even the notes you are writing, you can't explain it. You are writing it, but you can't explain it. Because it takes time. 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 It takes exercise. It takes time. You keep hearing it until you are tired. Then when you become tired and you are boring, that's when you started. Then at that point, you stay again. You keep hearing until the tiredness gives way. Now you are enjoying it. Because you have passed phases. You have now understood the value of what you are hearing. So it doesn't become boredom anymore. It becomes exciting. It's a journey. Glory to God. Am I communicating at all? It's a journey. In chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I mean chapter 10 verse 1. Put it up. Chapter 10 verse number 1. Put it up for me. Moreover brethren, I will not that you should be ignorant. I will not that you should be ignorant. He says, I do not want you to be ignorant. And he went on and on saying it to this church. Don't be ignorant. So, ignorance in the kingdom is not allowed. It's not permitted. You must spend time to teach. You yourself. You hearing me must spend time to teach. The same way I spend time to teach you. 
Because that's the essence of teaching, so that you can teach others. The things that I have, you have heard of me among many witnesses, what do you do? The same, commit to faithful men who shall in turn commit. So the essence of teaching you so that you too can teach others. So you must spend time to teach. <clears throat> and when it gets to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1, it now says, I do not want you to be ignorant. That is, I do not want you to be willfully ignorant. I want you to willfully recognize. In 1 Corinthians 15, 34, see, see what he told them. 1 Corinthians 15, 34. Awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. Some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. Awake. Awake. Arise. And sin not. I speak this to your shame. So you must develop your teaching ministry. Every member of this church. You must develop your teaching ministry. And teaching ministry is developed by teaching. You don't develop teaching ministry by thinking. It is teaching. Practice. 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 The first time you teach it to be clumsy. The next second time you teach it may even be clumsier. But after a while it starts getting smooth. After a while you start mastering it. After a while you start mastering after a while you speak and people wonder whether you were born speaking no it's practice and if you don't step out you will never know it so you must be ready to step out clumsily let people laugh at you if they need to laugh but at least you've started something are we in the building here yes teaching ministry has to be consistent as your pastor with all that i do and teach all the time if at any time I go on a break for two, three weeks and I come back to start teaching, even me, I feel the clumsiness for that little break I took. That's why in teaching ministry, you don't take a break. You keep teaching all the time. If you take a break, you will pay for the break. Because it must be consistent. Am I not communicating at all? Then imagine a man of God that does not teach for one year. Then he comes back. Even he himself will know that something has gone wrong. That's why some men of God, when they leave ministry for some time, they never come back. I cannot tell you of anybody I know who left ministry for some time and came back. I, I've no, I don't know of any. They never come back. Because they totally get out of tune. They get out of tune. And get into, they tune into something else. So ministry now doesn't look it anymore. That's why I say, till I come, it's, it's what you keep doing. Are we teaching here? It's what you keep doing. As a member of this church, once you start teaching, you don't stop. That's why you, you, you now embark on a responsibility to start a teaching center so that you keep teaching there. You keep edifying, building, admonishing the brethren. That's why Brother Paul calls it backsliding. He said, this guy, Demas, has backslid. You cannot backslide in salvation, but you can backslide in ministry. He has left me having loved this present world. He's in love with the things of the world more than he's in love with ministry. Are we in the building? Yeah. There's a place of practice. There's a place of continuity in, in ministry and in teaching. And because everybody here is a, a minister of the gospel, you know, whether you've started or not, that you are a part of this house, you're already a minister. It's just a matter of time it will, it will manifest because it's my responsibility to bring it out of you. To put doctrine and bring ministry out of you. Are, are you in the building here? Yeah, it is. Now, please pay attention to something else here. I want to deal with very quickly. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Sometimes what you are listening to in this church, you may not be the one who need it. But somebody will need it that will come to you. So that's why you must listen very well. Sometimes what I'm teaching, you may not really need it. But it will be useful for somebody else. And as somebody that God is going to use around the world... You have to listen attentively. Can I hear a powerful amen? Let's examine the ministry of the laying on of hands. The ministry of the laying on of hands. Because we're talking about how to get people filled with the Holy Ghost. The ministry of the laying on of hands. <clears throat> laying on of hands ministers the things of the spirit. One of the ways to minister the things of the spirit is via the laying on of hands. The laying on of hands. So things of the spirit can be ministered. We can minister the things of the spirit. We can minister them. 
We communicate spirituals by laying on of hands. We communicate spirituals by laying on of hands. See, see Moses and Joshua. Numbers 27, 18. Moses and Joshua. Numbers 27, verse 18. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take thee, Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the spirit, and lay thy hand upon him. Lay thy hand. Take Joshua. The spirit of God is already in him. But he still needs you to lay hands on him. Lay your hands on Joshua. Look at verse 23 of Numbers 27. Numbers 27, 23. And he laid his hands upon him. And gave him a charge. As the Lord commanded by the hand of Moses. He laid hands and spoke words. He laid hands on him and spoke words over him. Now, please listen very carefully. Laying on of hands is not symbolic. It's actual ministry. When hands are laid on you, it is actual ministry. It's not symbolic. We're not doing something that symbolizes. No, no. It's direct ministry. Laying on of hands. <clears throat> because the hands are actually ministering something. So you're not just doing a ceremonial thing. He says, lay hands on him and give him a charge before the people. Lay hands on him and give him a charge before the people. Then you find Ananias and brother Paul. Ananias and brother Paul in Acts chapter 9 verse 12. Ananias and brother Paul. We have seen an Old Testament example. We are moving to New Testament now. Let's begin with the book of Acts. And I've seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in. And putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Look at the next verse, 13. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he had done to thy saints at Jerusalem. Ananias said, God said, Ananias, one guy, Paul, is going to come. Lay hands on him. He will receive his sight. Ananias said, Lord, did you say, Saul? I have heard many things he has done in Jerusalem. I don't trust that man. God is telling you about somebody. And you are telling God you know the person better. <laughs> That's how dreadful Saul was. I don't trust that guy. I have heard the things that that guy has done. Then look at verse 17 of Acts chapter 9. See what happened here. Acts 9, 17. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house. And putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul. He called him brother. Brother Saul. That, that means there was an unlearning to relearn. He didn't call him killer, murderer, no. Brother Saul, that means we have the same paternity. Brother Saul, the Lord even Jesus that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest has sent me that thou mayest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. Why didn't Jesus lay hands on Paul and do the work? Why did Jesus send him to Ananias? Because God walks through men. Jesus appears to the man. And yet, Jesus didn't minister to him. Remember, he said, who are you, Lord? He said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. Arise, go, and Ananias will minister to you. Why didn't Jesus say, come, take, mm -mm. God doesn't minister to you. God uses men to minister to men. If I'm teaching, say I hear you. Yeah. The deliverance of men is in the hands of men. The healing of men is in the hands of men. Everything that a man needs on earth is in the hands of a man. God's method is men. And some of these men are even imperfect. You, sometimes you look at them, you see shortcomings. Brother, that is the best God has. That's all God has. He doesn't have any better. The people that God will use to minister to you are imperfect like you because of mortality. That's all he's got. He won't use a goat to minister to you. A goat is not better than a human being. That's all he's got. Are we in the building here? Yeah, that's all he's got. Now remember, he wasn't laying hands on Ananias to be, uh, on Paul to be healed. 
He was laying hands on Paul to be filled with the Holy Ghost. He was laying hands on Paul to be filled with the Holy Ghost. All right, now then we have Peter. Let's look at Peter. Peter in Acts chapter 6 verse 3. Peter in Acts chapter 6 verse number 3. Mm -mm. Peter, Stephen, and Philip. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. Look at verse 6. Verse 6, 6, 6, Acts 6, 6. Whom they set forth before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. When they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. They picked Stephen and Philip among others. They were filled with the Holy Ghost. What does it mean to be filled with the Holy Ghost? To be filled with the Holy Ghost means utterance. That's being filled with the Holy Ghost. Utterance. Utterance. Okay. Full of the Holy Ghost. That is they are full of utterance. That is the speaking tongues. And they have a good report. Then they laid their hands on them and they prayed on them. Or over them. Look at by verse 7. By verse 7 of that Acts chapter 6. By verse 7. Look at what verse 7. And the word of God increased. When they laid hands on those men in the church. And imparted grace on them. By virtue of that impartation. The word of God increased. And the number of disciples multiplied. Because the people on whom hands were laid on received an impartation of grace. So what one grace could have done, now you have 10, 15, 20 graces doing the same work. So the result, the turnover multiplied. Impartation took place. The word increased. The number of disciples multiplied. Not the number of converts or the number of church attendants disciples this morning i was just in the shower thinking about something and i just I, I just had you know the holy ghost said to me not every building is a church some places are just buildings because the pastor needs to build the church and you build church by teaching some people are just a crowd in a building with a label on it that has church but the content in the people is not church. So after you build a hall, you need to build people. After you gather people, you need to build them. That's the work. Go into all the world and make disciples. How? Teaching. Go into all the world and make disciples. How do you make disciples? Teaching. Teaching them two times. Double emphasis. Emphatic mention. Teaching them to observe all things that I have said to you. And while you're doing that, I am with you always to the end of the year. Teaching good this morning. Yeah. Say with me, I'm a, I'm a disciple maker. Say it very confidently. Say it boldly. Say it like you know it. Say, I make disciples by teaching. Say, I'm a teacher of the word of God. Say, I teach sound doctrine. I didn't hear a good amen. Stephen, full of faith. The word faith there is the word charis. In verse 8. Stephen full of faith. Acts 6, 8. Stephen full of faith and power. Did great wonders and miracles among the people. The word charis. Charis. The gift of the spirit. That faith was a gift. In verse 3 of that Acts chapter 6. He was full of the spirit. Utterance. So full of the spirit or trust, full of faith, another gift of the spirit. And by the time hands were laid on him, this same guy, something had happened. Before hands were laid, he was full of utterance. By the time hands were laid, he was full of faith. So something had happened in his life. Because laying of hands changes things. Laying of hands imparts. Laying of hands administers grace. Laying of hands adds to you. Laying of hands puts into you what is lacking. Laying of hands. Are you in the building? Yeah. And as we get into the new year, from now until the new year and into the whole of next year and until Jesus comes, I'm going to be laying hands on you more than ever before. Amen. 
I'm going to be laying hands on you more than ever before. And it's important for you to understand the importance of laying of hands. So when I put your hand, my hand on your head, you will take what it came for. You won't hold my hand. It is not in holding the hand. It is in taking it. Because if you don't understand it, laying of hands can be the same as shaking somebody's hand. There's a difference between shaking your hand and laying hands. I could lay hands on your head. I could lay hands on your shoulder. I could lay hands on your hands. Okay, but majorly, laying of hands takes place on the head. But it doesn't have to be the head. It could also be anywhere else. It could be your shoulder. It could be your hands. The important is there's a contact through which impartation and transmission takes place. If I'm teaching good, say a good amen. <clears throat> so something had happened to this guy by the time hands were laid on him. In other words, something supernatural had happened to him. It wasn't a mere ceremony. Again, in Acts chapter 9 verse 17, see what happened to brother Paul when hands were laid on him. Acts 9 17. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, has sent me that thou mayest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. 18. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales and he received his sight, fought with and arose and was baptized not water baptized with the holy ghost that means he began to speak in tongues in this see with impartation things happen pa, 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 pa. it's spontaneous it's spontaneous impartations make things it's like um how do i explain this um you know when when you treat malaria you know malaria when you treat malaria with attestment or with uh, one of those quartem you know when you treat malaria if you're swallowing tablets you will swallow one after eight hours, another one, then another one, then another one, until you take like six doses before malaria clears, okay? And sometimes, in the gradual taking of the medication, you, the malaria will start playing out. You become sicker sometimes, okay? But there's, there's, there's a way malaria will enter you. It is not that uh, tablet you swallow. It's injection. Doctors will say, confess, this malaria, you will not listen to me, tablets. We have to send the medicine direct into your blood. So they will chuck straight in. That one is instant action. Pa! It goes in. When we lay, see, when you are learning and learning, sometimes it's gradual. But when we lay hands on you, those gradual things are fast forwarded. So it's like taking you from where you're walking and putting you on a speed lane. You just find yourself. Things will just, so laying of hands unleashes deposits. It unleashes things that are dormant. It activates. It, it gets into you things that are there and you're not aware of. Suddenly, poof! I didn't know I could do this. I didn't know that this was happening in me. You, that is what laying of hands does. Are we in the building here? That's what laying of hands does. It releases grace. It, it, it makes you begin to function at a level you're not even aware of. Hallelujah. In Acts chapter 9, brother Paul was already preaching. Preaching Jesus, the son of God, after he just got baptized with the Holy Ghost. He started preaching straight. There was no waste of time. In Acts chapter 10, nobody heard of him. In Acts chapter 11, he was at Antioch because Barnabas brought brother Paul. He brought him and he was teaching. Then they sent Paul and Barnabas to bring relief to the saints in Jerusalem in chapter 11. Then in chapter 12, we see him go to Jerusalem and came back. So all we see of Paul is that we see him go to Jerusalem and he was teaching. By Acts chapter 13, look at Acts chapter 13 verse 1. Please pay attention. Acts chapter 13 verse 1. Now, there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger and Lucius of Syrian and Manian which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul which is brother Paul. Verse 2. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them why didn't the Holy Ghost say I have separated Barnabas and Saul he said you 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 men separate for me Barnabas it's me that want the separation but you will do it for me you you separate Barnabas and Saul for the work that I have given to them look at verse 3 look at what happened in verse 3 of that Acts 13 and when they had fasted and prayed fasting for laying on of hands is a demonstration of honor and a demonstration of consecration and seriousness 
Now she say, I know what is about to happen to me and I do not want to be careless about taking it. So I put myself in an environment where I am very, very spiritually sensitive and alert. So nothing misses me. When they had fasted and prayed, they laid their hands on them and sent them forth. They sent them forth. Are you still in the building? This is Apostle Paul running errands. Running errands. Moving all over the place. Because there is a place of service in the cadre of ministerial growth. There's a place of service. Let me tell you this. It is service that helps you to develop a culture of honor. Service. When you submit yourself to service, it helps you develop honor. Because in serving, there are people that will insult you. There are people that will handle you anyhow. And yet you have to be patient. So it helps you develop character. Service helps you develop character. It helps you de develop tolerance. And it helps you develop a culture of, of discipline. And a culture of, of excellence. A culture of excellence. If you meet a minister that has served another minister, even the way he talks and the way he treats ministry is different. If you meet somebody that has never served before who just stood up and carried briefcase and said, I have been called, you will see the pomposity of his lack of discipline. There's no way a man that has served somebody can be the same with another man that has not served anybody, no matter what is on top of your head. There is a, there is a, there is, there is a, there is a, there is a decorum that comes with serving people. So when you are now in position where you are the one that is supposed to be, you, to minister to people, you minister to them with an understanding because you came from where they are coming. I've seen ministers who serve nobody. I can tell that even the way they do things, you know that this one, he has a long way to go. That's why you find out that even in the Bible where ministry is concerned, it is, is Elisha served Elijah, Joshua served Moses, Timothy served Paul. It's, it's, the, it's the pattern for ministry. The 12 disciples served Jesus. They were the ones who took the bread. They were the ones that broke the bread. And it is in their hand that the bread multiplied. It wasn't in the hands of Jesus that the bread multiplied. Jesus only prayed and gave them the bread. And as they were breaking it, it was increasing. So the miracles happen in their hands. In the place of service, you will understand why things happen the way they happen in ministry. Because you'll be face to face with the practice of ministry. You will know why some people behave certain ways because you've experienced them. And you will know how to handle them. Because you will have to succeed with people in service. So in succeeding with people, you master the art of serving people and being a blessing and leading people. You can't beat it. You can't beat it. So that is why service helps you to humble yourself. Because if you're not humble, you can't serve. If you're not humble and you're serving people, the bottle of wine that you open, you will pour it on the person's shirt. Because instead of pouring it in a glass, since you're not used to serving people, you end up buffing the man. What he's supposed to drink, he will buff him. It is service that will make you have the discipline, the decorum, that culture. I'm teaching good here. See brother Paul, that was going to be the chief apostle of the New Testament. See him running errands. They sent him. The apostles gathered and said, oh yeah, go to Jerusalem. Yes sir. He went to Jerusalem. And when he finished, they said, come back and report. He came back. He came to report. Training with all the visions he saw in Arabia. He still came back first to be running errands. Why? That is the way to climb up in the ladder of ministry. If I'm teaching, say, I hear you. That's the way to climb up in the ladder of ministry. And we're talking about ministry here this morning because if you're going to be laying hands on people and minister the Holy Ghost to them, you must understand the foundation on which all of that operates. It's not just calling people, come, come. Have you received Holy Ghost? Kneel down, lift your hands up. It's beyond that. It's beyond that. There's a holistic understanding required. Say, I hear you. Yeah, there's a holistic understanding required to serve in the operation of ministry. Please pay attention very carefully. Pay attention. <clears throat> if you observe something, there's something I want you to notice. Brother Paul was not among the ministry gifts. Apostles and prophets gathered and called Paul and laid hands on them. 
they laid hands on them. Remember, the person that got Paul baptized with the Holy Ghost was not a ministry gift. His name was Ananias. Ananias was not an apostle. He was not a prophet. He was not a teacher. He was just a brother in church. Yet, it is a brother that ministered to the man that will be the apostle of the New Testament. Are we observing? It's a brother, Ananias. And he came and said, brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you has sent me to lay hands on you so that your eyes be restored and so you can be filled with the spirit. Don't wait until you wear white color on your neck. Is it color or color? Or color, whatever they call it. That's it. Don't wait until you wear it. Right where you are, right now, under the sound of my voice, there is ministry inside you. Am I communicating at all? Yeah. It's Ananias. Ananias was not anything. He was just a brother. A brother in church. And then the second time was among the apostles. And they laid hands on Paul and sent them forth. Now, by the time you read for them, he, he, you know, you will see that he tested them immediately. There was a test. Elemas. Elemas the sorcerer. And what happened to brother Paul in Acts chapter 9 happened to Elemas in Acts chapter 15. Look at Acts chapter 15 verse 12. <laughs> Acts 15 12. Then all the multitude kept silence and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. Remember that this is after Acts chapter 13, where they have sent them forth. Miracles began to happen. They had laid hands on them. In fact, the first notable miracle that happened in the life of brother Paul was after the laying of hands in chapter 13. By chapter 14 verse 7, a notable miracle. After they laid hands on him. Look at Acts 14 7. Please pay attention. Acts chapter 14 verse 7. And there they preached the gospel. Verse 8. And there was there sat a certain man at Lystra, impotent in his feet, being a cripple from his mother's womb, who never had walked. Verse 9. The same had Paul speak, who steadfastly beholding him and perceiving that he had failed to be healed. Verse 10. Said with a loud voice, Stand upright on thy feet. And he leaped and walked. That was the first notable miracle in the life of Brother Paul. And that miracle operation in the ministry of Paul came by the laying on of hands. An impartation. Spirituals were administered. Spirituals were administered. When hands are laid on you, spirituals are administered. Amen? So laying on of hands is a supernatural ministry. It is not a symbolic practice. Some of us who went to denominational churches and were used to, they, they touch oil and dab our forehead. That's not laying of hands. That's ceremony. What we're talking about here is spiritual. It's serious. When hands are laid on you, something happens. Amen? I said amen. When hands are laid on you, something happens. In 1 Timothy 4.14, see what brother Paul said to Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 14. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy, with the laying on of the hands of the elders. Of the elders. By the laying on of the hands of the elders. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 6. 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse number 6. Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance that thou tear up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. Notice that he kept telling him on two occasions. Remember, hands were laid on you. Remember, hands were laid on you. And remember, words were spoken over you. Remember, acknowledge it. And walk in the consciousness of the impartation that has happened in your life. I put you in remembrance. The hands were laid. Your head is not an empty head. You are not carrying an empty body. Something is at work inside you. I put you in remembrance. Steer it up. Steer it up. When hands are laid on you and you are face to face with people who need ministry, steer it up. Tell yourself, I'm carrying something. I'm carrying something. And these people need what I carry. Come here. I want to pray for you. Lay hands on them. Remember you carry something. I say remember you carry something. 
Say, I carry something. Say, when hands are laid on me, something comes from my inside. Say, I put you in remembrance. Hallelujah. I said, Hallelujah. Don't treat it as common. Don't treat it as common. Notice that the key word here, if you observe Moses and Joshua, the one thing that stands out here is that in the Old Testament, this man had a relationship, an ongoing relationship. That was key. That was key. Just like we have relationship here as a church. Hallelujah. Ministry gifts minister things for ministry. If you observe, Ananias laid hands on Paul. Paul only spoke in tongues. But by the time the apostles and the prophets laid hands on Paul, ministry came out of Paul. Ministry gifts minister the things of ministry. And it becomes much more effective when there's a relationship. That's why brother Paul's instruction to Timothy was direct and personal. By the hands which I laid on you. By the hands which I laid on you. Moses, Joshua. If I look at the resultant effect of when Moses laid hands on Joshua. Look at what happened to Joshua. In Deuteronomy 34 verse 9. Deuteronomy chapter 34 verse 9. Hallelujah. And Joshua the son of Nun was full of the spirit of wisdom. For Moses had laid his hands upon him. And the children of Israel hearkened unto him. And did as the Lord commanded Moses. <laughs> Only did they observe. They didn't do as the Lord commanded Joshua. But who laid hands on them? Huh? Moses. Laid hands on who? Joshua. And Joshua. Israel hearkened to Joshua. And what did they happen to Joshua on the account of? What God told Moses. So Joshua is an extension of Moses' ministry. Joshua cannot claim to be a general overseer. Uh -uh. He's an extension of Moses' ministry. So the vision of Moses is what Joshua carried. Joshua didn't carve out his own vision. It became one vision. And that vision is redemption. The redemptive purpose of God. Am I blessing somebody this morning? If you're learning, shout hallelujah. So laying on of hands, you know, can, can, can pull out of you a diversity of operations. It can bring out of you a diversity of enablements and abilities. And the principle is simple. Without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. The less is blessed of the better. I'm not saying that somebody is better than you in Christ. I'm saying somebody is better than you in ministry. All of us are the same in salvation, but we're not the same in ministry. Am I communicating here? Yeah. Responsibility in the kingdom is what makes the difference. Responsibility. Brother Paul says, esteem them that labor among you and labor over you in the Lord. Among you... And over you. Responsibility. Among you and over you. He said, esteem them. That means they rate higher than you in the Lord. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 12. As I begin to round up. Are you blessed this morning? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And we beseech you brethren to know them. Which labor among you and are over you in the Lord. And admonish you. Verse 13. And to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake and be at peace among yourselves. That means we must, we must all act according to the measure of God's grace available to us. Amen. We have distinctions in function in the ministry. And laying of hands is supernatural. Laying of hands is what? Supernatural. The Bible says in Mark 10, 16, Jesus called the little children. He says, suffer the little children to come to me. And when the children came to him, he laid hands on them and blessed them. So when hands are laid on you, a blessing comes to you. Every time hands are laid on you. 
Sometimes you may fall and sometimes you don't have to fall. Okay? Sometimes you may, sometimes you don't have to. The important thing is that a contact took place. And sometimes the contact can take place in a way that it overwhelms you. So, your body gives in. But whether you fall or not, it's not a requirement. What matters here is that you are in honor and you are expecting to receive. And when it is released, you receive. Hallelujah. Say, I receive impartations of the supernatural. Say, I receive impartation of the gift of God. Say, I receive impartation of divine abilities. Say, I receive impartation of ministry. Say, there is ministry on my inside coming out of me to touch my world, to change my world, and to be a blessing to mankind. I didn't hear a powerful amen. Are you blessed this morning? Hallelujah. Stand on your feet this morning. I want to pray for you. Ooh. In the second service, I'm going to enter proper how to get people filled with the Holy Ghost. We're just laying foundation. Because there is how to get people to be filled with the Holy Ghost. And if you're here, you're not yet filled with the Holy Ghost. You don't yet speak in tongues. I mean, we can do it quickly now, but I wouldn't want to do a quick walk. It's good you follow the second service and then at the end we lay hands on you so you can pray in tongues, so you can function in things of the spirit. You know, uh, so if you're serious, stay for the second service. You know, <laughs> they that hunger and test after righteousness shall be fear. Sometimes you have to go an extra mile to show how serious you are for the things you're expecting. Sometimes you have to. Amen? As I said, Amen. I'm not hearing your amen. I said amen. amen. Are you blessed this morning? Are you blessed this morning? I'm going to be laying hands on all house fellowship leaders in the second service. All house fellowship leaders, district pastors, and all those missionaries. All the missionaries who are going on missions in this church. If you're going on missions, you've already, you know, you've already been assigned to a local government. You've been assigned somewhere to go and start campuses, start Bible study centers. I'm going to be laying hands on all of you in the second service. And I'm going to be ministering to you because I need you to hear what I will teach in the second service so that you are well, you have clear understanding. Then I will lay hands and minister to you. I didn't hear a good amen. So, and then those who want to speak in tongues, you, you are not yet speaking in tongues. You can speak in tongues in the second service. And it will be like this. Because once you have understanding, it allows for the things of the spirit to flow. I didn't hear a good amen. I'd like you to place your hand on somebody, touch somebody, hold somebody, place your hand on somebody's shoulder. Let's pray in tongues for a few seconds here. Let's pray in the Holy Ghost. Everybody in the building. Let's pray in the Holy Ghost. Let's minister to one another. It's called body ministry. Body ministry. Let's minister to one another. Let's minister to one another. Our online community, join us. Just pray in the spirit. Wherever you are, around the world, join us. Just pray in the spirit. Pray in the spirit. Whether you're online or on Kingdom Life Network, on television, wherever you're watching the service, just begin to pray in the spirit. Let's pray for one another. Let's pray in the spirit, everybody. And if you cannot pray in tongues, go ahead and just begin to praise God and worship God and thank him for what Jesus has done in your heart. Thank him for what the Holy Ghost is doing in your life. Baba. Go ahead and pray in the Holy Ghost. Go ahead and stir up the gift of God on your inside. Hey, 
membro da zekele de brona katele de ba angele de bo zekele de brina kale de boroka tolege barakate anga baso perege deska legre de sekele de ba brogo do zekele de ba bra rakoto belida ba barakatila namana hey. Mozaba, 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 Mozaba. Rato. Brenda Zoko Loda Baro de Belida Baba Baba Rada Baba Belede Babo. Eh, Baraka Toke Sekeana. Thank you, Father. In the name of Jesus, I like you to, you know, bring your hand down and pray for yourself. Father, make me an instrument of service. Make me an instrument of blessing. Make me an instrument. Make me an instrument of changing lives. Make me an instrument of this gospel. I preach this gospel in and out of season. I receive boldness. Pray for yourself. I receive boldness to preach your word. I receive boldness to teach your word. I receive boldness to manifest your kingdom. I receive boldness to heal the sick. I receive boldness to demonstrate your word. To demonstrate your word. I receive boldness to manifest your grace and glory in my generation. Oh God, I am a plus to the kingdom. I am a blessing to my world. I am an instrument of the gospel. I bring change. I bring liberty. I bring freedom. I bring liberty pression over your people around the world go ahead and pray for yourself karato begada engre de sukala da ba e shakola da ba oh lord i'm available use me for your glory use me for your glory flow through me lord jesus Flow through me, Lord Jesus. Use me for your glory. Thank you, Father. I'm willing, I'm available. I'm willing, I'm available. Use me as a light in the darkness of this world. Use me as a light in the darkness of this world. Me subranan torodobosa kayada. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. Can I hear a powerful amen? Lift your right hands to heaven. Father, we rejoice. Thank you, Lord, that it is you that walketh in us both to will and to do of your good pleasure. And Father, we rejoice that this morning we acknowledge that we have a huge responsibility to teach the things we have been taught and raise disciples all over the world. And Father, even in this responsibility that you've given to us as a ministry to reintroduce Jesus to this generation, equipping believers to know what they have, who they are, and what Christ can do through them, I pray that everybody in this church is a luminary to this world. In the name of Jesus. I declare that you receive boldness. Receive boldness. Hey, I say receive boldness. I say receive boldness. Boldness to preach the word. Boldness to demonstrate Christ. Boldness to manifest the kingdom. In the name of Jesus. And I decree that every one of you under the sound of my voice is enriched in all things. You lack nothing. You are abundantly supplied for. In the name of Jesus. Mato Branagas. Zibro gadaya nahata Mamronda golo do boro to sikele de baba le grando zekelene mara tabila na mangenge angere de sikala da brina katole do boro koto sekele de brina katole da baba le grodo jokolo do brina katole da ba rakoto bengle de boho sutia Lord I decree that everyone here is a blessing to his world in the name of Jesus you are an agent of change you are an agent of redemption you are an agent of salvation. You are an agent of deliverance. You are an agent of the manifestation of the glory of God. In the name of Jesus. We are not ashamed of the gospel. 
We are not ashamed of the gospel. We are not ashamed of the gospel. We are not ashamed of the gospel. The gospel of Christ is the power of God unto salvation. Is the power of God unto salvation. Is the power of God unto salvation. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Is there anybody here not ashamed of the gospel this morning? You are not ashamed of the gospel of Christ? Go ahead and celebrate the gospel. Go ahead and celebrate the gospel of Christ. The power of God. The gospel of Christ. The power of God. The gospel of Christ. The power of God. Glory. Say with me, I have the power of God in my hands right now it is a gospel the gospel is the power the gospel does not have power the gospel is the embodiment of power you know somebody says i want the power of god i say sit down open your bible he said no i'm not saying i want you to teach me bible i want the power of god i say maybe you're looking for the devil because if it's the power of God, there's no other way of transmitting the power other than the gospel. If I teach you the gospel, what am I giving you? Power. Say, I carry the gospel. The good news of Jesus to my world. Say, I'm a custodian of the power of God. I didn't hear powerful, amen. You are a carrier of God's power. Heal the sick. Cast out devils. Raise the dead. Listen, if you pray for a sick person and he doesn't get healed, pray for the next one. As you begin to practice, they will start getting healed. There's a place of practice in the operation of the, of, of, of the supernatural. When you start, it may be clumsy. After some time, it, when you pray for somebody, it may delay. After a while, you start seeing instant. It takes practice. The things of the spirit are practiced. There is a practice in the things of the spirit. There is a practice. Say, I hear you. Because as you begin to practice, you become perfected in it. Hallelujah. 2021 is going to be a glorious year. We are going to see cities. We are going to see nations. We are going to see continents. If you are part of this, shout glory. Every man's world will be invaded. The whole world needs the gospel and we have the gospel say i have the gospel say my community will no more be deprived i will take the gospel from doorpost to doorpost house to house community to community i am an agent of redemption salvation deliverance i am an agent of change that only the gospel can provide i didn't hear a good amen everybody both those of you online on television all of us on radio we're all agents of change go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature go go and these signs shall follow those that believe glory to god are you blessed this morning hallelujah now listen to me i'm going to take up offering now remember we have a special offering to take today how many of you remember? I announced that last one. We have a special offering to take today. We have a window of opportunity. And I want those of you online to please listen and on television to listen. I'm not going to give you details of what it is. But you've got to trust me as your man of God. And the reason why I'm not going to give you details is because you don't even need the details. If you trust me, you know, you, you know you, you, if you trust me, that's enough. But I want you to trust me. We, we want to raise some money for an outreach we are doing you know, for, for our TV station on a platform that we want to be able to acquire i've been praying for us to get on that platform for over 10 years we applied they told us there was no availability and that platform is a very good platform in the days and weeks to come we'll announce it publicly you know uh, um, and then suddenly last week they called me and said that opportunity is available to us okay but we need to get some money we need to pay them a once off money to be able to acquire that opportunity and our channel can be on that platform you know and uh, you know for the rest of life we're paying just a once off it's not like a monthly thing we're paying we're just paying one time and then we'll be on that platform for the rest of life and that platform is an effective platform very effective last sunday i mentioned to those of you that were in the service but because now we're on global i don't i want to be as exclusive as possible so we're asking for people to support us with a thousand dollars or more you know, a thousand dollars or more. And those of you online and on television, if you really want to be a part of this, 
if you want to be a part of this, shoot a mail right now to Dr. Abel Damina at yahoo.com. You want to support us with a thousand dollars or more to help us acquire that platform and get the TV channel on that platform. It will reach many, many more millions of people all over the place. Many, many more millions of people. I mean, serious. It, you know, and um, we have a responsibility. As the days keep going by, you begin to understand the value of things. That the only thing that matters in this life is what you do for the kingdom. Anything natural, anything material is just for this life. When you leave this world, you will leave them behind. The only thing that waits for you in eternity is what you do for the kingdom. Towards changing lives, towards touching lives, towards saving people from darkness to light. Remember, the reason why God gave people money from Egypt to the promised land was to build tabernacles. God blesses you and gives you ability to make money. And let me be honest with you. When you give to the kingdom of God, it is no more a matter of convenience. It becomes a matter of sacrifice. Brother Paul said, you have given a sacrifice acceptable. A sacrifice acceptable. A sacrifice is not in the amount of money you give, but in the sacrifice that it involves. And I want to really ask those of you that are watching, listening, both in this building and online, I need people to, you know, quickly, quickly help us with a thousand dollars or more. You know, and if you are stirred up in your heart, you want to be part of this, I'd like you to shoot an email to Dr. Abel Damina at yahoo.com and we'll find a way of making sure we give you some information. Now, online community, listen, all the Facebook people, all of you on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram following right now. And those of you on Kingdom Life Network, Kingdom Life Network, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, I want to have a meeting with all of you tomorrow on Zoom. On Zoom. Tomorrow on Zoom. You follow this ministry. You've been following our teachings. I want to have a conference with all of you on the online and television who are following right now. You, you're a part of this house. I want to meet with all of you on Zoom tomorrow. Zoom tomorrow morning. So what you will do is, I'm going to do a Facebook broadcast today. I'm going to do a Facebook broadcast today by 4 p.m. 4 p.m. GMT plus one today. On that broadcast, I will give you all the Zoom ID and the access code for the meeting tomorrow. I'm going to do a Facebook live broadcast today for you guys so that you can get the Zoom details. I need to you know, share some things very important with all of you on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Kingdom Life Network. And like I said, you want to, you want to be a part of this project, send a mail to Dr. Abel Damina at yahoo.com indicating your desire to, to be a part of the project on, uh, on uh, you know, Kingdom Life Network. And please, we need the money redeemed within now and Wednesday because we need to get the monies to these people within the week to secure that slot so that nobody takes away that slot from us. Praise the Lord. Can I have a good amen in the building? All right. I want to take up your offerings this morning. We give in joy. We give, you know, in worship. We give in honor of what Christ has done. I'd like you to grab an offering, everybody. We want to worship and give this morning. Hallelujah. If you're watching online, the banking details are scrolling. If you're watching on TV, there are banking details for you to give your offerings as we honor the word of God and honor what we have received even in the course of this service. Lift up your offerings, Father. We rejoice for the privilege to give. We give in faith. We give with joy. And we ask right now, all over the world, as your people are honoring and worshiping Jesus through their givings today, that our offerings are a sweet smell and offering acceptable. And as we give, we give with joy. Thank you for the privilege to make a difference through our givings today. In Jesus' precious name. And every believer says a powerful amen. amen. Once again, social media community, I'm signing you up, but don't forget to be in the second service. It's going to be a serious service. Second service at 11 a.m. GMT plus one. And remember, I'll be doing a Facebook broadcast at 4 p.m. today to talk about the Zoom conference tomorrow. But we love you guys still. I'll see you at 11 a.m. this morning in continuation of the service. Enjoy the grace of Christ. Let's celebrate viewers around the world for being a part of this service. Somebody shout glory! Amen! Amen. Hallelujah. Me. Hit the music. Let's do it. And everybody, just drop For your up. All the messages and books by Dr. Abel Damina. Please call plus 234-806-800-9939 or email powercityoffice at gmail.com.